I'm um, honored to to be here to presenting uh, at, at your grand rounds. Appreciate the invitation. I see many of my colleagues and friends joining here today. Of course, you know, we all have many patients in common and uh, um, you can always get this info on the fly, just a nice e consult over to psychiatry. So the BPSD ones kind of come to me or to Jeremy Peacock, my Gero psych colleague, who's got a ton of experience in this area, and Allie Ellison, who's a nurse practitioner uh, who specializes in geriatrics and is also doing some nursing home consultation right now, which has been immensely helpful. And that's mostly BPSD kind of stuff. So we're happy to help support you in, in your clinical care of patients. Um, uh, there's another part of this story, uh, which is that um, I, do public health research around improving dementia care, especially related to BPSD. And so I've done that at three different sites now at the Prairie Clinic in Sauk City, at Richland Medical Center in Richland Center, and in Milwaukee Health Services, uh, the FQHC in Milwaukee. So we've had, that's been uh, grant funded work to test out different models of basically helping primary care clinicians and their staffs with managing BPSD. And we're working on a, um, an NIH grant application right now where we're hoping to involve uh, some of you in, in, in that project in uh, uh, kind of trying out our educational model of improving dementia care. So uh, if you're interested in learning more about that, please, please, uh, uh, please let me know. Okay, um, so let me just start uh, with a story. Uh, so this is Augusta Data. She was a German woman who was hospitalized in uh, 1901 uh, with um, a variety of neuropsychiatric symptoms. She was, I believe, 47 or 48 years old at the time, um, had had no formal psychiatric history before that, uh, but it had a period of increasing agitation, paranoia, physical aggression, wandering about at all hours of the night, um, and also had very significant cognitive symptoms, including being very amnestic and um, uh, having difficulty with reading and writing and even just basic orientation stuff she really struggled with. So she was psychiatrically hospitalized and 1901, um, she died in the hospital five years later. So the, these were, of course, it's a very different model of inpatient care. This is kind of the traditional asylum care. Um, and the physician who had initially admitted her went on, moved on elsewhere, but then came back to do her her autopsy. And that physician was, was Alois Alzheimer, who was then the first in 1906 or seven to uh, present and publish on uh, what was then viewed as kind of an unusual atypical case of senile dementia, the, the terminology of, of the time that involved uh, very prominent cognitive symptoms and also very prominent psychiatric symptoms. The reason I tell the story is because our current definition of dementia in general and dementia due to Alzheimer's disease in particular is very focused on cognitive symptoms, which I'll talk more about in a moment, um, and not so much on the um, psychiatric symptoms, but in fact, going back to the very first reported case, the psychiatric symptoms are very prominent and uh, even now, though the psychiatric symptoms are not part of the criteria, uh, about 90% of people with behavioral and psychological, I'm sorry, with dementia will eventually have behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia or BPSD uh, along the way. So, uh, not, so not only are those symptoms very prevalent, and, and in a moment I'll kind of spell out what those specific symptoms are, they're quite distressing to patients and caregivers. They affect people's ability to live independently. So folks with BPSD are more likely to be hospitalized, more likely to be moved to a higher level of care than folks with dementia who don't have BPSD. Uh, and uh, uh, they can be quite dangerous to themselves or others when there's physical aggression or wandering or refusal of care that uh, that that is taking place. And so that's that's the rationale for uh, for presenting um, today. So by the end of today, 
Uh, here are our learning objectives. You'll be able to describe how to evaluate BPSD and discuss the elements of a plan to manage BPSD, uh, including non-pharmacological interventions. So I will spend a good chunk of time talking about the medication side, since that's what we're often, as clinicians, asked to do or to weigh in on. Uh, but the reality is that the database is much more strongly supportive of behavioral, environmental, and psychological interventions than they are for medication interventions. And that's both on the efficacy side and the risk side. And so I'll, I'll show you that, um, show you that, uh, all, all those data supporting that statement. Uh, disclosure, so as Dr. Lobson mentioned, I, I do have uh, a book on this topic and I get royalties uh, on that and I'll be referring to my book as well through, throughout the presentation. Okay, so just to kind of, you know, start at the foundations, um, uh, you know, I mentioned the original case description of Alzheimer's and uh, disease and, and into the late 70s, early 80s, uh, there, there was the definition of Alzheimer's disease did include the psychological elements as well as the cognitive elements. Beginning in the early 80s, it really shifted over to being thought of as a cognitive disorder first and foremost, and that is encapsulated in the current DSM-5 criteria. Uh, so broadly, dementia or major neurocognitive disorder involves significant cognitive decline from a previous level of performance in one or more of these areas. So in Alzheimer's disease, it would typically be learning and memory early on, as well as language changes early on, sometimes visual spatial things early on as well. And then as the illness progresses, challenges in social cognition, meaning how do you behave appropriately with other people and executive function like planning and decision making and strategizing and sequencing things and impulse control, all that falls under executive function. So you've got to have decline cognitively and then there must be some associated functional impairment. So that's the dividing line between MCI or mild cognitive impairment or mild neurocognitive disorder and dementia or major neurocognitive disorder. There needs to be some functional impairment to uh, to to diagnose someone with uh, with dementia. Uh, it, just by way of review, when we're talking about dementia, we're talking about a variety of different possible etiologies. The most common etiology in the U.S. is Alzheimer's disease and. The data I'll share with you today is mostly about Alzheimer's disease, although I'll also talk about ways in which some of the other diagnoses differ, like Lewy body di disease in particular has very strong psychiatric elements and has a somewhat different treatment approach pharmacologically than does uh, Alzheimer's disease. Uh, vascular dementia, frontotemporal dementia can have a very psychiatric presentation, especially the, the behavioral variant of frontotemporal dementia, wherein people have disinhibition, aggression, mood lability on the one hand, and apathy on the other hand, and they can have both depending on the extent of the frontal lobe uh, changes. And, and that can show up in fairly young folks, uh, ages 45 to, to 65. So uh, vascular dementia often has a strong depressive apathy component to, uh, to it as well. Okay, so now these are some or most of the specific BPSD. Um, I'll just, um, I, I won't talk about all of them, but I'll just kind of highlight some of the, the critical ones. So this is prevalence from diagnosis to death. So anywhere along the way of the course of Alzheimer's disease, uh, what percentage of patients have these symptoms? And one thing you'll notice, if you just look at the prevalence column, uh, that number, if you just added that up, that would be way more than 100%. And so what that means is people have multiple symptoms, either simultaneously, you know, for example, paranoia, irritability, agitation cluster together, depression, anxiety, insomnia cluster together. So simultaneously, you may have more than one, or longitudinally, you may have more than one. So Apathy becomes progressively more common as dementia progresses from mild to moderate to severe stages. 
aggression tends to peak in the kind of moderately severe stage and then levels off a little bit in the severe stage. Um, uh, uh, depression tends to be a little more prevalent in the MCI uh, mild stages and so on. So one person could have a variety of symptoms over the course of the illness as the dementia progresses. Um, Let's see, I'll just say a quick word about apathy and depression since those are the two most common and they can be confused for each other because the, the behavioral manifestations are very similar. Withdrawal, less activities, less enjoyment in activities, less contact with other folks. Uh, but the distinguisher there is the emotional state. So people with depression tend to be sad, hopeless, worthless, feel like they're a burden on their family. People with apathy, they're apathetic about their situation. So they might have a little bit of irritability because folks with apathy are often pushed to do more things that they want to do. And so that may contribute to some irritability. But in general, the affective state is one of indifference. And so that uh, distinguishes it from depression. And the reason I point that out is because the treatment approaches are somewhat different. The pharmacological, I'm sorry, the non-pharmacological approaches are similar, but the pharmacological approaches are different with antidepressants being used for depression and under, under certain circumstances, methylphenidate or other stimulants being, being used for apathy. Aggression is the one that uh, is most troubling often, and that's what results in phone calls to us from facilities, from panicked family members. It results in emergency department visits, uh, might involve uh, hospitalization as well to manage. And that aggression is a broad category that includes things like verbal aggression, yelling, cursing, using slurs, etc., or sexually inappropriate language, and then physical aggression like kicking and biting and, and so on. I won't go through all these. I just wanted to to highlight uh, highlight three of the most common and just point out that uh, there are a wide variety of these that can also um, coexist with each other. Unfortunately, euphoria is only seven percent. So this tends not tends to be an, an illness more that involves depression, anxiety, and irritability than than it does uh, joyful feelings. Um, as I mentioned a moment ago, the behavioral symptoms can vary by, uh, by dementia type or etiology. So uh, I talked about frontotemporal dementia already, Lewy body disease. So Lewy body disease has very prominent psychiatric symptoms, especially psychosis. Vivid visual hallucinations are a hallmark of Lewy body disease. People can describe their hallucinations in, in great detail. Um, sometimes folks have insight about it, sometimes they don't, meaning they recognize that this is a hallucination versus they really do think there are a bunch of children in their room or a thief who's trying to rummage through their stuff and steal their wallet or purse and, and so on. So vivid visual hallucinations um, and then often associated with uh, with paranoia or delusions of theft, pe uh, feeling like people are stealing from them or kind of messing with them in uh, in some way. Uh, significant anxiety and then often predating the REM, uh, I'm sorry, Lewy body disease is REM sleep behavior disorder. So people may present with a lot of nighttime difficulties, falling out of bed, flailing about, striking their bed partner, calling out at night. That can be a harbinger that the person is is going to um, develop uh, develop Lewy body disease. So, so the specific BPSD do vary somewhat by the etiology of the dementia. Um, there's no one unitary model to explain why behavioral symptoms arise, and they probably vary across the symptoms and vary across people as well. So, like a straight up neurobiological model might help explain apathy. So, someone with frontotemporal dementia or with advanced dementia due to Alzheimer's disease or with vascular dementia that primarily involves the white matter connections from the frontal lobe to the rest of the brain may present with apathy because effectively the part of the brain that's most responsible for motivation and for initiation of activity, the prefrontal cortex, um, has either atrophied or has been effectively sectioned off from the rest of the brain, as would be the case in vascular disease. And so that decreased 
metabolic activity in the prefrontal cortex, decreased innervation of the prefrontal cortex results then in a lack of initiation and motivation, which is apathy. So straight up neurobiological explanation for apathy. Uh, behavioral model uh, posits that um, there are you know, folks have behaviors, there are antecedents to those behaviors, there are consequences to those behaviors. So that's A, B, C, antecedents, behaviors, and consequences. Uh, we can also we can clinically say, you know, are there triggers for the behavior? What is the behavior? And how do folks respond to the behavior? And in a behavioral model, you can then address at each one of those points, address the trigger, try to shape the behavior, try to shape how we respond to the behavior. Um, the, I'm just going to skip ahead and then come back because I'm trying to remember. Oh, yeah. So I'm going to spend more time in the progressively lower stress threshold model. The unmet needs model is a, is, um, it's a powerful explanatory model that goes like this. So when a person with dementia has a behavior that is problematic, uh, they're not doing it volitionally or intentionally. That's often a key educational point for family members and other caregivers. They're doing it because they have an unmet need that they are un otherwise unable to express. So I'm hungry, I'm lonely, my hip hurts, uh, I'm constipated, you know, et cetera, whatever it might be, uh, because of dementia affecting the person's ability to communicate that need, it comes out in other ways like physical aggression or wandering or refusing to get out of bed or to shower or whatever. Um, and so that puts the caregiver in a position of a bit of a detective trying to figure out what is the person living with dementia trying to express through their behavior. And the danger of treating the behavior as a behavior itself to be addressed is that you may miss the underlying unmet need and potentially even exacerbate the need. So, for example, if someone is super constipated and is agitated and I put them on a lanzapine and a lanzapine is very constipation causing, I might actually exacerbate the problem rather than, than address it. And then finally, the progressively lowered stress, stress threshold model um, posits that all of us have a stress threshold. And as we approach that stress threshold, we start to get some anxious behavior. So that could be feeling anxious, feeling irritable, getting restless, getting fidgety, withdrawing from the issue, from the thing we're trying to address. And then when we go over the stress threshold, that leads to dysfunctional behavior, anger, acting out, throwing things, et cetera. Uh, and, and so all of us have the stress threshold, and that can vary based on like how much did I sleep last night, um, or what time of day is it right now, have I been working for 14 hours in a row, et cetera. And in folks with dementia, in general, their stress threshold is lower than folks without dementia, and perhaps more prone to variation over the course of the day. So the stress threshold may be worse at 4 or 5 p.m. after the person's been up all day than at 8 a.m. when they've just gotten up from sleep. So so this might be an explanatory model for sundowning, for example, that as a person is approaching their stress threshold, that they're starting to get anxious and then ultimately agitated. And again, this can be a powerful therapeutic model. We can teach family members and other caregivers to monitor for anxious behavior, use that as a signal that the person is approaching their stress threshold, and then do something different. Um, have the person do a different activity, have them take a nap, go for a walk, listen to some soothing music, something to pull them back from the stress threshold. Because once the person is over the stress threshold, it's much, much more difficult to, uh, to respond to that. Okay, so those are some explanatory models. I'm going to spend a couple minutes just talking about the assessment side of things. Uh, I've encoded this in a form that either we fax over to the facility if a facility is calling us about the behavior or my nursing staff goes over it with the family member of the facility. So really the first step is just trying to get a good understanding of when the facility says so-and-so is agitated again, please prescribe a lansapine, we can kind of dig into the details of that. Well, when exactly is this happening? How often? How long has this been around? Is this the same thing that we've talked about many times over the last six months, or is this something new or escalating more recently? A critical question is around severity, because severity will determine disposition, including the appropriate setting for trying to manage behavioral symptoms. As much as, much as possible, we really try to manage behavioral symptoms 
in situ. One, because a transition to another setting, like an emergency department or an inpatient psychiatric unit, is challenging in and of itself. And two, even if, say, someone, say someone's hospitalized at Stoughton's Gerald Psych Unit, which is a phenomenal unit, and like, you know, meds get tuned up, their behavior is great, everything's awesome. They still need to go back to their prior environment, and there, there very well may have been environmental issues that were contributing to the BPSD that were not addressed because the person was in, was in the hospital. So as much as possible, we try to manage things in situ, but if there's imminent dangerousness, then the person may need to move to another setting. And we try to distinguish that from distressing behavior, so like repetitive questions, um, uh, uh, you know, wandering around without uh, trying to elope from the home or the facility like that could be bothersome but that isn't necessarily dangerous and so we might respond to that in a bit of a different fashion than if someone is dangerous i mentioned the abc model of asking about antecedents and consequences and then a critical issue is whether it's a new behavior or not because if it's a new behavior i tend to do like a mini delirium workup like are there any new meds recently, any dose increases, especially anticholinergic meds or opiates or benzodiazepines, uh, possibility of a UTI, any recent electrolyte disturbance. So kind of a, a mini medical workup will go along with a new behavior, whereas a recurrent or very similar behavior probably does not really require uh, a repeated reevaluation. Re There's heavy caregiver burden. So I'll often in the office setting, I'll screen the, it's typically um, spouse or adult child. I'll screen them for depression with a PHQ-2. And then these next few points, I'll elaborate on the next few slides. I'll be thinking about medical contributions. Pain is a huge issue. So many people with dementia have um, under addressed pain and that can contribute to agitation. And there's a fairly straightforward intervention involving scheduled use of acetaminophen, which we'll talk about that may help with pain and agitation. And then a good look at the medication and substance list. So, this is a long list. I wouldn't look at every single one of these things every time someone has BPSD. Top of my mind would be UTI or other infection, maybe maybe COVID infection pre presenting as causing or exacerbating BPSD symptoms. Older adults are quite prone to hyponatremia. Meds that I prescribe, like SSRIs, can exacerbate the hyponatremia. Um, people with dementia may not do a great job of managing their fluid status, and so they may be prone to some electrolyte disturbances. Some of the recent falls I'd be thinking about, you know, have they struck their head and could they have a TBI or a subdural that might potentially be contributing to their current behavioral symptoms. And then something I think about fairly universally would be things like that are very common, like constipation, urinary issues, dehydration. Do the person lose their hearing aids again? Do they wear glasses, but they don't have them for some reason? So those are those are fairly common things that we're thinking about addressing when folks present with BPSD. And then I mentioned REN sleep behavior disorder. Another big one, especially if someone has depression or apathy, is um, is ruling out sleep apnea. On the medication side, the big offenders are going to be anticholinergic medications. Um, and then, um, you know, alcohol is not good for BPSD for a lot of reasons, not good for dementia for sure. And then similarly for, for cannabis and, and, uh, uh, cannabis use is skyrocketing among people over 65, and the strength of cannabis now is is remarkable, and it's sort of laced with various things, and there are various allegedly safe variants like Delta 8 and Delta 10 that are not safe. So it's sort of, as you all know, it's, it's out there. Folks are using cannabis uh, and can cannabinoids in all sorts of forms. And in general, um, A, they don't help behavioral symptoms and uh, they might worsen them. There is an endocannabinoid agonist agent called nabilone that has some evidence of efficacy for BPSD, but it's not, I think there's like one study in that regard, but it really hasn't kind of made it to more widespread clinical uh, clinical use. And, and certainly like dispensary cannabis or gummies or whatever, those are things that are not gonna help BPSD. CBD as well. CBD will not, uh, there's no evidence supporting the use of either THC or CBD for BPSD, and THC could exacerbate uh, BPSD.
Um, as we face an increasingly diverse population, uh, a, a lot of what we know about BPSD was kind of, you know, we, that literature comes from, uh, from older uh, white people typically, and so we have less information about BPSD in minoritized populations. Uh, in general, as best as we can tell, the prevalence of BPSD is similar across various racial and ethnic groups. Not really clear. There's not much LGBTQ literature about this, so we, we don't know uh, a lot about prevalence or severity of BPSD in LGBTQ older adults with uh, dementia. Uh, and there may also be cultural factors that affect how a person or a family member understands their dementia and the behavioral symptoms and whether or not medical attention is sought. Like if dementia is simply thought to be part of the normal aging process, then family members may not seek medical attention. And of course, uh, obviously, uh, older adults from minoritized groups may face all sorts of barriers with respect to access to care, including language barriers and stigma and structural racism and, and, and so on. So um, this is an area that's not super well studied, but certainly requires our attention as we care for an increasingly diverse group of folks with BPSD. Okay, I'm going to spend the remaining time. So I've, I'm going to talk for, set my timer for 18 more minutes so that we have uh, uh, 15 minutes for questions. And uh, of course, again, I'm always available for questions. Afterward, feel free to email me or e-consult me or whatever. I'm, I'm always this is one of my favorite topics in the world, so I'm always happy to chat about this topic. So let me just start 25,000 foot view of management of BPSD. So if we've identified any contributing medical causes, of course, we want to address those, whether it's UTI or sleep apnea or pain, discontinue any offending medications or substances. Uh, BPSD are quite challenging for family members and other caregivers, so they often need a lot of support and education. I'll talk more about that. The, the mainstay of management is really having a non-pharmacological plan or a sort of more positive way of thinking about it is a psychological, behavioral, and environmental management plan, and I will share with you some of the details of evidence-based approaches. In general, we really try to avoid adding new psychotropic medications unless there's a risk of harm to the patient or others. There could be some exceptions to that as well, like someone with fairly severe depression or anxiety, but who's not suicidal, there may not be a harm issue, but there's significant distress and discomfort for the patient. And so that might warrant an antidepressant trial, for example. But especially when we're talking about like antipsychotics, we really try to limit that to dangerous situations. Uh, if we add a med, we want to regularly monitor outcomes. And then, of course, if there are acute safety issues, getting the patient and family members into safe settings. Okay, so again, there's a little bit of reiteration, but I think this is the third or fourth time I've said this already, but really first line approach is our behavioral, environmental, educational approaches, and second line are gonna be meds uh, when the behaviors are dangerous or potentially very distressing to the patient. So what is the evidence base around psychological, behavioral, and environmental interventions? So um, uh, there's a very strong evidence base for these. There are some caveats around this, including these aren't easy to uh, uh, implement. They don't come in pill form. We can't just snap our fingers and have music therapy or problem solving therapy taking place. Um, uh, we ask other people to implement these things, in particular family members who themselves may be burnt out or depressed or anxious, and, and paid caregivers who also may be burnt out, poorly paid, not well supported, understaffed, etc. So um, this is a little bit of an kind of ideal world way of thinking about it, that uh, if we had kind of adequate staffing and staff training and benefits and, and salaries of staff, then a lot of these things could get much more easily addressed. Also, most of these studies really take place in, have taken place in nursing homes, and so their generalizability to other settings, especially home, is less clear. But at the patient level, the, the data uh, supporting efficacy are for structured activities, so planning stuff for the person throughout the day. When someone's acutely agitated, music therapy has been shown to be effective. 
There's a Dutch word snoozelin, which refers to multi-sensory stimulation, which is basically you try out various sensory modalities to help soothe the person. So that could be tactile, that could be something auditory like music, that could be something visual like some uh, like uh, a, a, a virtual aquarium or, you know, pleasant lights or some, something like that. So that's snoozelin. For folks with depression, reminiscence therapy might be helpful. Um, and, and just as a as just a general point and a positive way of thinking about dementia, um, you know, especially early in the course of dementia due to Alzheimer's disease, while short-term memory is deeply affected, often long-term memories are very preserved. And so that person with dementia could actually be a very important repository of family history, for example, because they do remember, you know, when Uncle Joe immigrated to the U.S. or, you know, whatever, they'll they'll sort of know those stories. And, and that's um, sort of the basis of reminiscence therapy. At the facilities level, there are formal training programs. My team at Wisconsin Alzheimer's Institute does this. We train folks in DICE. We've trained all the dementia care specialists around the state who work for the various counties in Wisconsin on, on DICE. And then there are QI approaches that might be helpful. And then at the family level, the strongest evidence is for like caregiver support groups. Uh, there's other stuff out there. So aromatherapy doesn't work. So, you know, your room will smell pleasant like lavender oil or vanilla or whatever, but it doesn't actually make any difference with respect to behavioral symptoms. Light therapy has generally been shown to be ineffective. Therapeutic touch or massage is a little bit mixed. You can see how that might help in some situations, but in others, especially if someone's paranoid, uh, not be such a great idea. And then unfortunately, validation therapy, which is the idea, you know, let's say um, a person is saying, why do you keep stealing my, my wallet from me? Uh, I would in response say, oh, it seems like you you feel like you've lost something. That, that would sort of be validation. Um, it doesn't work, unfortunately. So it's a nice strategy, but in this context is not shown to be helpful. Uh, there might be some other approaches that could eventually be helpful. That it includes training families in behavioral approaches, pet therapy, exercise, simulated presence is where you play audio or video of a loved one, and that might have some um, some soothing uh, benefits. There are like robotic things as well, like robotic pets. Not great evidence base for that, but uh, a reasonable thing to uh, to try out. Um, again, some of the caveats I've mentioned, you know, these studies have mostly been done in long term care. They do need to be tailored to patients and need to be culturally specific and sensitive. It's a significant investment of time to train staff on these things and staff turns over and staff are short short staffed. So it's quite uh, can be quite challenging to actually implement these these interventions. I will say the dementia care specialists that we've trained. So Dane County has a couple. Most every county has one or counties have banded together to hire one. They are terrific resources in this, especially in the behavioral, environmental and psychological approaches. So facilities Facilities can be referred to dementia care specialists, family members can be referred, patients themselves. So they're a really nice resource that we're fortunate to have in, in the state of Wisconsin. Okay, so remaining time is gonna be on medications. So again, uh, we wanna turn to medications only if the symptoms are severe, dangerous, and are causing significant distress to the patient. Um, so, some general caveats before we add a med. So, often our patients already have significant polypharmacy. So, we'd be potentially adding another med with drug drug interactions or synergistic side effects. In general, clinical trials have not really shown meds to be all that effective, even things like risperidone and olanzapine and so on. Uh, really, the effect sizes, as I'll show you, are not terribly high. So the efficacy side is, is not great, and the risk side is really significant. So all the antipsychotics have, um, uh, have an FDA black box warning around not using them, 
even <laughs> even uh, Brexpiprazole, which just got FDA approved for agitation and Alzheimer's disease, first ever drug, another antipsychotic. So on the one hand, the FDA said there's enough evidence to support its use. On the other hand, it still has a black box warning around use in people with dementia. So it's you know it's a, you can see how sort of fraught this this whole area is. And then um, oh, and I apologize. Th this slide, this last bullet point needs to be updated. So Brexpiprazole was uh, recently approved. Approved and in addition, Pima Vanserin has been improved for some time for Parkinson's disease psychosis. I apologize for not updating that slide. Uh, there's the issue of informed consent. So often patients themselves can't provide consent. So we're working with a proxy decision maker, then uh, activated healthcare power of attorney or, um, or a guardian to be making these decisions. So that adds an additional layer of complexity. As with all geriatric psychopharmacology, we start low and go slow, and often the doses end up being significantly lower for older adults, especially older adults with dementia than, uh, than younger adults or older adults without dementia. So just to give a little bit of a treatment algorithm, this is a simplified one. I, I have a bigger one if folks want to see it that also includes things like inappropriate sexual behavior and wandering and so on. But for today's purposes, I simplified it down to psychosis, agitation, depression, and apathy, the some of the most common behavioral symptoms that we see. So in general, the evidence base would support for psychosis, in particular in the context of Alzheimer's disease, uh, antipsychotics like risperidone, olanzapine, aripiprazole, brexpiprazole, probably less data supporting quetiapine. In Lewy body disease psychosis, we really try to avoid antipsychotics as much as possible because they worsen the Parkinsonian symptoms, the motor symptoms. And so that's where Pima Vanserin or better yet, because it's cheaper and more readily available, Dinepazil or another cholinesterase inhibitor would be the gold standard for psychosis in Lewy body disease. For agitation, there's a wide range of stuff. There's antipsychotics. Uh, there's one old study on prozosin being helpful for agitation. There's literature on trazodone for being helpful for agitation in frontotemporal dementia. And so not just trazodone as a sleeper, but using it uh, BID or even TID to help with some agitation during the daytime. Um, and then there's a little bit of evidence on SSRIs being helpful for agitation, in particular citalopram. Uh, for depression, the data has been really mixed. The strongest data is probably for citalopram. And then for apathy, by far the strongest evidence is for methylphenidate, but that comes with the potential for significant cardiovascular side effects as well as seizure risk, agitation, insomnia, appetite suppression. So um, uh, the risk benefit is pretty slim for methylphenidate for, uh, for apathy. So just a little more on the antipsychotics. So the, I've listed here the antipsychotics that have at least some data in this area. The quality of the data varies. Uh, so again, it's strong enough for the FDA to have, have approved Brexpiprazole for agitation in Alzheimer's disease. The strongest evidence base, though, is for the first three that I've listed. We have by far and away the most studies for risperidone, olanzapine, aripiprazole. Quetiapine is used a lot, but the evidence base is actually quite weak for quetiapine, and this is probably a dosing and tolerability issue. So most of our patients probably can't tolerate past 100 milligrams of quetiapine a day. But that's where the efficacy is. It's 100 to 200 milligrams of quetiapine. So that's the challenge with using quetiapine. Clozapine has a very, very specific niche in the Lua body world. Uh, so in addition to Pima Vanserin and Dinepazil, clozapine may make sense uh, for psychosis or agitation in folks with Lua body disease. I list haloperidol because it's sometimes used in an emergency setting, but in general, we really, really try to avoid haloperidol because the mortality risk is higher with haloperidol than the atypical antipsychotics, and there are all sorts of other issues around Parkinsonian symptoms and tardive dyskinesia and so on, so it's, it's best avoided. This is the now almost 20-year-old study that left, led to the FDA black box warning. So this was the state of the art in 2005, we, but we basically replicated this repeatedly since then, so it's still consistent. It's, these are the numbers that I cite to family members. So um, uh, if you tally uh, all the 
so let me just walk you through this. So we've got various antipsychotics. We have the number of trials at that time, including the number of subjects in those trials, the percentage of folks who died in the treatment arm, the percentage of folks who died in the placebo arm, and what the odds ratio is. So if you just look at the literal bottom line, uh, it's about three and a half percent people died in the first 12 weeks of being an antipsychotic versus 2.2 percent of people who died in the placebo arm. So this is not a healthy group to begin with. And so these are the numbers I cite to family members. I say if we do nothing, uh, the odds of your loved one dying in the next 12 weeks is around 2 percent. If we treat with an antipsychotic, um, I shouldn't say do nothing. I should say if we don't treat with an antipsychotic, it's 2%. If we do treat with an antipsychotic, it's about 3.5%. And these numbers have generally borne the, the, the test of, of time. And, and certainly the, the notion that antipsychotics increase mortality, that's very, very widely accepted. That is very clear. The two mechanisms of action that are most likely are aspiration pneumonia. People get sedated, they aspirate, they die from the pneumonia, or a cardiac arrhythmia. So most of these agents have some effect on QT prolongation. And, if, and again, like especially in the context of vascular disease, someone's already got extensive supervascular problems. Uh, this may tip people over, uh, over the edge. There are other causes like stroke, uh, DVT and PE, but the, the biggest ones by far are uh, pneumonia and, uh, and cardiac arrhythmia. Uh, lots of other side effects. So antipsychotics are sedating. They cause cognitive impairment. They can cause extrapyramidal symptoms. And I've listed the order in which they are most likely to least likely to cause extrapyramidal symptoms. So realistically, people with Lewy body disease, if, you know, like denebazil doesn't work, many people turn to quetiapine at that point. The data is not great supporting efficacy, but it's very unlikely to worsen the motor symptoms of Parkinson's. All psychotropics increase the risk of fall and, uh, and associated risk of fracture. There are metabolic issues, there's stroke risk, edema. I see a lot of peripheral edema arise in people with, uh, with, uh, with antipsychotics. Okay, efficacy. So again, the efficacy data is not great. So again, FDA approved Brexpiprazole. Um, I would not use it first line despite that. It's very expensive and the database is just, there's just much less. The far fewer studies of Brexpiprazole than for Risperidone, Olanzapine, and Aripiprazole. So those are my own go-to agents. Uh, I mentioned already the issue with quetiapine, but even like best case scenario, the effect sizes are not great. 0.16 is very low. The number needed to treat is six. So for every six people who appear to respond to risperidone, uh, only one had a true response. The rest was placebo. It was passage of time. It was some other nonspecific intervention that was taking place. So the true medication effect is, is quite low. And surprisingly, the studies show very high placebo effects, uh, which, which you would not think. You wouldn't think that someone who's like throwing their wheelchair at people or whatever would respond to a placebo. But in reality, these symptoms wax and wane a lot. And so often if you can just kind of ride it out non-pharmacologically, uh, you might be able to uh, then get away with, with not having used a medication. Um, just in general kind of principles, starting at the low, at low doses, getting up to the minimum effective dose is tolerated. Here's another really key point. I go in with a plan that I'm going to stop the medication. So typically within four to six months. And so that's consistent with all the guidelines. That's consistent with like OBRA nursing home regulations around you should try to stop an antipsychotic or do a gradual dose reduction every six months if possible. Uh, and that's because the mortality stuff persists even after the first 12 weeks. It persists for up to three years. There's an increased mortality with antipsychotics versus placebo. And if folks are no better, definitely stop. And even if they are better, plan to stop the antipsychotic, which can be a little bit of a tough sell to, pay, to family members and to facilities, but would be consistent with the evidence base. Here's some of the, the dosing. Um, uh, I, I hope these slides will be shared. If not, I'm certainly happy to share these around. So I won't go into detail about this, but these would just be guidelines about what starting dose and then the maximum dose that, that you would expect uh, would be tolerable with each of these medications. Again, much, much lower than you might see in younger folks or folks with schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, 
as I mentioned, we really try to you know, go in with a plan to eventually stop the antipsychotic, make that clear from the outset that this is going to be a temporary measure. Now, that being said, there are some folks where you tend to stop and they get worse again. Then you know, okay, that wasn't a placebo response. That was a true response to the antipsychotic. That person may need to stay on antipsychotic longer than six months and, and perhaps even significantly longer. So what are the alternatives? I'll spend the last uh, minute or so on this. So among the antidepressants, the strongest evidence base is for citalopram, 30 milligrams. It is a dose associated with QT prolongation. So, so I'll try 10, then 20. If those aren't working, I'll go to 30 and then check an EKG to see where their QT is at. Um, less data on escitalopram, it may not cause the QT prolongation. And certainly, unfortunately, after like initial good results, like has not been replicated. So not, uh, I use sertraline, but I, I have less confidence in it than I would citalopram, especially for agitation. Trazodone, I mentioned for FTD. 40 oxygen is a newer antidepressant that may have some pro-cognitive effects. It's very expensive. So that's the main downside, but I've used it a fair amount in folks who have both depression and cognitive impairment. Uh, bupropion, maybe for apathy, although the most recent study was negative. Mirtazapine, there have been a ton of negative trials. Uh, I think it still has a niche in folks who are really sleeping poorly or losing a ton of weight, but like for depression and agitation and dementia, probably not going to work all that well. Uh, other failed meds, and then I would definitely avoid anything anticholinergic like paroxetine or tricyclics. There are safety concerns with antidepressants, so folks over 65 are at risk of developing hyponatremia with SSRIs and SNRIs. Probably bupropion is the only one that's free of that side effect, but all the other antidepressants can do it. So I'll check a baseline sodium, and if it's on the low end, I'll follow it. If it's pretty solidly normal, like 140 to 145, I'll probably just leave it be. But you can kind of expect that a person's sodium is going to drop a little bit when you start an SSRI or SNRI. Other options, so I use a lot of acetaminophen. I'll just go ahead and prescribe 1,000 milligrams TID or, B, or, or sorry, BID or TID unless there's some, unless they're actively drinking or have active liver disease. Um, Dexamethorphan, there's a, it is FDA approved for pathological laughing and crying. I've actually never once see, seen it work. I've prescribed it a bunch of times and just not had any success with it. Uh, melatonin might be helpful, especially at high doses for REM sleep behavior. So that's like 10, 15 milligrams of melatonin at bedtime for REM sleep behavior disorder. And what else? I mentioned methylphenidate, pimavanserin, prozosin. And back in the day, like when I was a resident and fellow, we used a lot of Depakote for BPSD, Valproate, but we've generally moved away from that because the efficacy data is not great. It's associated with CNS atrophy um, and tolerability is very poor of Valproate. So I'll still use it periodically if other stuff have, hasn't worked, but I've really relegated it to uh, try to avoid uh, using it as much as possible. So, in conclusion, sorry for rushing it a little bit at the end there, I want to make sure there's time for questions. These symptoms that I've been talking about, BPSD, are almost universal. They're quite um, impactful in not so great ways. Uh, in general, after we've conducted our evaluation and ruled out reversible causes, we're really trying to do um, environmental, behavioral, psychological, educational measures, caregiver supports, and if those don't work and the behaviors are dangerous or distressing, that's where medication options would come in with probably antidepressants for depression and anxiety, methylphenidate for apathy, and antipsychotics for psychosis or agitation, but then with all the caveats around antipsychotics that, that I've mentioned. As gloom and doom as that all that sounds, I've done this for 20 years because I do think ultimately we can be we can be helpful. Uh, we can be helpful to pe persons living with dementia and to their family members and caregivers. So thank you very much. And I look forward. Oh, there's my contact info. So feel free to email me if you like, or you know, send me a secure chat or in basket or e-consult or you know, whatever whatever way you want to get a hold of me, please. I I'm always happy to talk about EPSD.